The Lord be with you. As we recall our disobedience to God's commandments and our failure to do his will, let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Let's say together the words of Psalm 130. Out of the depths have I cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to mark what is done amiss, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the night watch for the morning, more than the night watch for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. A reading from Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. God led Ezekiel into a valley of dry bones and asked, can these bones live? And at least Ezekiel had the good sense to realize that he couldn't answer that. But he knew that God knew the answer. And so he said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know because only God knows only God knows the answers to the big questions like that big questions like why suffering why illness why death and why coronavirus we don't know the answers to questions like that but God does twice in my life I've stood in a place that could only be described as a valley of dry bones. The first time was in 1987 in the Luero Triangle in Uganda. I'd gone there with a youth group from the Mission Society CMS Ireland to carry out some voluntary work at Mengo Hospital in Kampala, the capital. But while we were there we spent some time with a group of missionary doctors. They went weekly to carry out a clinic on the steps of the local hospital in a remote village called Chiwoko. Chiwoko was in the heart of the Luero Triangle, a place where during the Ugandan Civil War between 200 and 300,000 people had been massacred in the course of five years. The war had finished only a year previously and we could still see the bones of the dead lying scattered at the side of the road. It's hard to imagine what it was like 
in a place like that, a valley of dry bones, where it would have been easy to lose all hope and all faith. And yet there was still hope and there was still faith. God breathed new life into the heart of that situation and very soon the little clinic that was held weekly grew into a hospital. Nowadays if you go to Chiwoko Hospital you'll find a very busy active hospital there and in the years since the missionary doctors and the local Ugandan Christian staff have brought health and healing, hope to many many people. Countless thousands have been helped through the work at Chiwoko. God breathed new life into dry bones in the Luero Triangle and brought hope to many. My second experience was in 1999 when I visited Gahini Diocese in Rwanda with a group of parishioners from Dungiven and Boviva. While we were there we visited a place called Nyarabuye. It was a church centre, a church and a secondary school which had been the site of one of the worst massacres of the Rwandan genocide. Nyarabuye was a place of shelter for many people who were under threat from the local militias. And when the danger was at its worst, people went to the church to seek refuge. Indeed, many of the local leaders encouraged them to go there to find shelter. But actually, what they were doing was not so much sending people for safety and shelter but simply herding them together into one place so that when the militia came people would be gathered together and when the militia did come in the course of one day 25,000 people were killed. When we visited Nyarabuye the local people there had begun to gather up some of the bones that had been lying in the fields and bring them into one of the disused school rooms they had started to create a small memorial. We could still see the dry bones lying scattered around. And all around the church there were fields marked with countless wooden crosses, simple wooden crosses marking mass graves. If you go to Nyarabuye today, the church is still there, a mission centre reaching out with God's love to others. And the old school has been turned into a memorial centre the Genocide Memorial Centre, that's a place from which people proclaim that message of peace and reconciliation, that even out of the worst atrocity of the Rwandan genocide, God can bring hope and healing. Again, God breathes new life into dry bones. A reading from John's Gospel, Chapter 11. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth round his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. We can't even begin to imagine what it might have been like to be there on that day when Jesus called out and Lazarus, who had been dead, stepped out of the tomb. To our way of thinking, that sort of thing just doesn't happen. I'm sure the people back then didn't think any differently. And maybe even Ezekiel would have agreed that dry bones, dead bones, usually don't come back to life. Now of course Lazarus would one day die again. 
and his sisters Mary and Martha would again have to go through that experience of mourning the loss of their loved one. But in calling Lazarus out from the tomb, Jesus was not just bringing him back to life. He was also showing us that God is in control of all things, even life and death. God has power over life and death and can breathe new life into dead bones. Jesus was showing us what would happen to him, to Jesus himself. It was in the context of raising Lazarus from the dead that Jesus spoke the words, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. And anyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. We're just two weeks away from Easter, the time when Christians around the world will celebrate the Lord's resurrection. But in the two weeks between now and Easter, and even in the weeks beyond that, politicians and doctors and scientists have all told us that things may get worse before they get better. Over the next few weeks, we may well be faced with trouble and hardship, with illness and suffering, and yes, with bereavements and death. We may wish that it was different, but we have to prepare ourselves for the reality of the situation. And yet we do so with faith and with hope as Easter people. So may the approach of Easter remind us that God is more powerful than any situation. God is more powerful than any hardship or illness or suffering and that nothing not even death can separate us from his love and may that knowledge fill you with a renewed faith and a renewed trust in the God who can breathe his new life over any valley of dry bones and in the Lord Jesus who is the resurrection and the life. Amen. We join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And the collect of the fifth Sunday in Lent, Passion Sunday. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, Grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for all who are affected by coronavirus, through illness or isolation or anxiety, that they may find relief and recovery. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for doctors, nurses and medical researchers that through their skill and insights, many will be restored to health. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us.
We pray for the vulnerable and the fearful, for the gravely ill and the dying, that they may know your comfort and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We finish with a blessing for Lent. May Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, and to take up your cross and follow him. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon your household and with all those dear to you, this day and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord.